Chapter 20 of Half Hours with the Lower Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter 20 The Spiders A little insect half as large as a grain of corn finds itself on a limb high above ground and is desirous of reaching another five feet away. It is not a jumper, at least it could not hope to cover this distance, neither has it wings but it has a marvelous silk manufacturing apparatus known as spinnerets, and, elevating its abdomen, it reels off a thread which the wind carries across the chasm where it lodges. Across the single cord the spider runs, the act being suggestive of the intelligence of these insects. The common garden spider which may illustrate the group, is seen to differ very materially from the scorpion. The abdomen is not ringed or made up of segments, but is large and plump and connected with the thorax by a delicate cord or pedicel. The spiders, as we have seen, have a spinning arrangement by which they form beautiful webs or nets to capture prey. By this silken cord they can lower themselves from great heights. The single thread which supports them is made up of a number of minute threads. The webs are formed in endless variety and with all the skill of a bridge maker, being guide, supported, and braced in a manner which, if the work of man, would be said to be the result of endless study. They are perfect in their arrangement, and each web is a study in geometry, yet the spider builds it with the greatest rapidity, never hesitating in the making or repairing. By my door is a huge spider similar to the one shown in figure 172. It has a beautiful web which covers a space two feet square, but the spider rarely occupies it. Nearby it has a covering formed of a leaf of a fern which has been pulled down each side and fastened, forming a little room just the size of its body. Wondering how the spider would discover a victim caught in the web, I examined it carefully and then placed a grasshopper in the web. Instantly the spider noted the disturbance, having what to all intents and purposes was a private telephone line. This was a single guy line leading from the center of the web to its retreat, where one of the spider's claws rested upon it, holding it so that the slightest swaying of the web lifted its foot. When an insect became entangled, the spider darted at it and by skillful manipulation of its hind pair of legs, reeled off its silken cord and attached it to the victim at every point, in a short time literally binding it in a roll. If it was likely to escape, the spider would bite it using its poison fang, which paralyzed it. The biting mandibles are terrible weapons from which there is no escape. The inner jaws are equally sharp and effective. The eyes of the spider are very brilliant, and in a bright light can be seen to gleam and glisten like points of steel or fire. They are minute dots seen just above the mandibles. The male and female spiders often present a very different appearance, the male being smaller. The spiders deposit eggs which are enclosed in silken balls or nests of various kinds, in which they remain until the young are hatched. 
some are concealed in the web others are placed underground and some are perched upon a stalk resembling a plant there appears to be no limit to the uses to which the marvelous silk of spiders is put some spiders form balloons with which they sail away through the air i have seen scores of these aeronauts in the air at one time another form constructs a raft of leaves bound together with silk some build nests for small game as gnats the silken cord made by others is so tough that it can be used as thread by partly destroying a web and suspending a black cloth behind the locality the operations of the spider in building and repairing can be plainly seen it is well to place the spinnerets beneath a microscope under which they appear to be made up of many points touch one of these and a glutinous secretion adheres which when stretched is seen to be silk and each point provides a separate thread which joins with the others producing one cable the spinnerets are to some extent movable they can be turned to the right or left and wherever they touch the silk remains glued fast this explains why the spider moves and works so quickly and accomplishes so much the amount of silk secreted is astonishing and some idea that can be obtained by walking over the country in spring early in the morning on the slopes of the sierra madre in the san gabriel valley i have seen the surface of the ground for a great distance covered with webs which caught the rays of the sun as it rose presenting a most beautiful appearance this fabric covered hundreds of acres in a fairy maze of web so many traps for unwary small fry of the insect world with a small stick i have wound a large amount of silk from the spinnerets of a spider there apparently being no diminution of the supply professor bert wilder wound from the large spider known as nephila plumapes several miles of silk some spiders have long slender legs and are rapid runners others as salticus are very deliberate but powerful leapers jumping upon their prey like a cat perhaps the most remarkable leaping spider is one from australia called the flying attis having singular flaps or wing-like extensions upon its sides one of the spiders not only runs over the surface of the water readily but spends a part of its time under the surface carrying down a bubble of air for its supply of oxygen the bubble acting as a diving bell the spiders are very solicitous of their young placing every safeguard about them and resenting any attack by a fierce rush several large spiders carry their young upon their backs the little spiders are rubbed or scraped off when they become too great a burden the spiders are natural hunters and trappers and a volume could be written on their methods and adventures in running down prey once as i was crawling through the almost stifling brush of the florida keys i came to a little opening about five feet wide across which was a large conspicuous and powerful web in the center of this web clung a huge and most remarkable spider colored a vivid yellow and black i watched it for a few moments while resting and then touched the web whereupon the spider began to swing by raising and depressing its body increasing its speed rapidly until i could with difficulty see it a moment later it disappeared almost entirely before my eyes for half a minute the spider kept up this motion then it slowly came to a standstill having demonstrated that it could easily disappear from any bird enemy without running away 
I have seen the daddy long legs perform the same feat in California. The spiders which build webs from plain geometrical traps to cone-like affairs are interesting, but the trapdoor spiders and those which dig burrows are among the most wonderful artisans and engineers of the insect world. One of the most perfect doors in hinge, fit, beauty of interior, finish, and quality of its outward defense is built by a spider. In the illustration, the den and its trapdoor is shown, and in figure 178, a sectional view of the same is seen, but the door is never found open, the spring or hinge being so devised as to remain closed. I have found many of these dens in Southern California, sometimes a foot or more in length. The spider is not the large one shown in the cut, which is a tarantula, but is very much smaller, though a large spider. The genera, Tenisa and Nemesia, are best known for their cunning and skill as builders. The California spider begins its den when very small, and I have found many the size of goose quills with door complete, in the vicinity of a large den. In forming the burrow, the spider carries out the clay bit by bit, and when it reaches a point below the surface, it begins to line the sides with a silken tapestry. The door is an upper extension of this lining. It is round, about the size of a silver quarter, or a little larger and is formed of silk so woven and interwoven that it becomes a pad of seeming satin, which by continued manipulation is made to fit with marvelous perfection. The spring or hinge is so adjusted that the door always closes, and with a snap. The exterior of the door is covered with clay, and is made to simulate the surroundings so exactly that only the sharpest eye and one skilled in the work can distinguish it. In some of the European spiders of this kind, the door is carefully covered with moss and plants. The work of building is done at night. The spiders feed at night, and in returning to the burrow they can lift the lid instantly, dart in, and turn about to seize the cushion or pad of the door with their fangs, and hold it so tightly by bracing back that some little strength is needed to force it. I have often lifted the door with the blade of my knife, and seen the spider rush up and seize it. In all the doors, little round holes can be seen where the mandibles or fangs hold. The spider can be caught by pouring water into the burrow and forcing it out. In the island of Temos, there is a trapdoor spider which does not hunt, but combines the methods of other spiders. It comes out at night, fastens back its door by a thread, then builds a web nearby and waits for its victims to become entangled. The largest spiders are called tarantulas, though the term is applied to some forms not so large. They are hideous creatures and are very common in Southern California. They are five or six inches across the legs, and the body in some forms is as large as a small mouse and is covered with reddish hair. They form deep burrows, but not trapdoors, the entrance being open or covered by a web. They are supposed to be very poisonous. My Gale Hintzii is the name of the common American species found in the southwest. They hunt at night for grasshoppers, crickets, and other small game, and can often be seen lumbering along over the roads at sunrise, returning from a hunt. Sometimes these huge spiders migrate in a body, 
such a movement having been observed in Southern California. A South American species has been known to attack and capture small birds, though this may be considered rather the exception than the rule, their food consisting of large insects and small lizards. Of all the spiders, the tarantula turacula is the most remarkable, as it not only makes a deep burrow, but erects above it a chimney-like structure with all the skill of a human workman. Indeed, the structure, in neatness and perfection of design, is far superior to many of the chimneys seen among the poorer classes of some countries. The spider lays the miniature timbers across with the precision and exactness of a skilled carpenter, and after the manner of human log cabin builders. The female carries her young upon her back, as shown in the illustration. End of chapter 20、Chapter-21-of-half-hours-with-the-lower-animals.This-is-a-LibriVox-recording.All-LibriVox-recordings-are-in-the-public-domain.For-more-information-or-to-volunteer-please-visit-LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter 21. Some Six-Legged Insects. One of the great divisions into which the insects are divided relates to their possession of six legs. This includes a marvelous array of creatures. Among them we find the singular little glacier flea and the springtail, a prodigious jumper. The latter is found in damp places, and when touched will release a forked spring which is held in place by a hook, and this sends the insect flying into the air like an acrobat. These humble little creatures present a strange contrast to the lace-winged insects, which are among the most beautiful of the tribe. The mayflies are well known for the wonderful exhibitions they sometimes make, the air being filled with them, a joyous, beautiful throng, destined to live but a few hours. In South America, they occur in such vast numbers that they are collected and used as guano. The young pass through a strange change, having little resemblance to the parent, and live in the water where they breathe by means of several plume-like gills. Among all the insects of the field and swamp, none are more familiar than the dragonfly, which children were once led to believe had a vicious habit of sewing up the eyes and mouth of any one, hence the name darning needle. These insects are often beautiful, with their rich wings of glistening lace, four in number, their bodies gleaming in tints of bronze, blue, and black. The abdomen is long and slender, like a needle. The head is prominent and armed with powerful jaws. The eyes are large and compound, with several single eyes as well. Some dragonflies are very small. Others are large, as those of the Malay archipelago, where the natives trap them and use them for food. The dragonflies are hunters, preying upon other insects which they capture on the wing, and large forms have been seen taking very young fishes from the water, swooping down upon them like hawks. The development of the dragonfly is interesting from the fact that the young lives a long period in the water. The eggs are deposited in the water, hatching out into curiously shaped creatures, which are among the most ferocious of all the water insects. 
they pass two years in this form preying upon other animals and even small fishes the larva has a proboscis which ordinarily folds over the face and is called the mask but when an insect approaches this strange appliance with powerful jaws or hooks is shot out with dire results after the two years have passed the pupa as it is called climbs up a stem leaves the water and casts its skin appearing as a full-grown dragonfly ready for a life of rapine on land in many insects the habits of the young are much more interesting than those of the adults not far from my home in the arroyo seco which leads down from the sierra madre are great deposits or beds of fine sand which i find often covered with little pits if a section is made it is found to be a perfect bowl almost half an inch in depth as though a top had been pressed into the sand and taken out if sand is rolled into the pit something appears quickly at the bottom and mysteriously tosses it out and if an ant topples over the edge and rolls down the sides out comes a fierce pair of jaws and seizes it if the ant escapes the unknown creature still concealed hurls sand at it endeavoring to bring it down often with success this singular creature is the larva or immature young of the ant lion itself an attractive large lace-winged creature resembling a dragonfly it lays its eggs in dry places the young are wingless big-jawed creatures which for two years live the life of a trapper each forming a pit and concealing itself beneath the sand at the bottom the huge jaws being in the center ants are the game of this lion and as they run along they often topple over the sides which like those of a toboggan are very slippery down the ant goes its descent being accelerated by the lion which places sand upon its back and bombards the unfortunate so adding to its confusion that it rolls down and is seized by the jaws of the lion at the end of the two years the lion surrounds itself with a ball of sand and silk and in three weeks appears as the perfect insect unless one is familiar with the eggs of the aphis lion he will never find them they resemble minute plants growing on long stems fastened to a leaf these hatch out and become little creatures resembling the ant lion with huge jaws but the most extraordinary changes and series of different individuals are found among the so-called white ants which are really not ants at all but among the most destructive of all known insects the first white travelers in africa reported the discovery of gigantic ant hills some of which were twelve feet in height and one hundred feet in circumference equally large mounds have been found in australia large areas of country being dotted with these striking landmarks among the most remarkable of all animal structures these mounds are often as hard as rock and hunters have sometimes escaped from the charges of wild animals by climbing upon them they are the work of the so-called white ants a section made through one of them as seen in the illustration shows the singular home of a remarkable community there are really four kinds of ants here all representing a different phase in the growth of the insect and all performing a certain work they are the female the male the worker and the soldier and there is a winged king 
in their lives these insects have many features which resemble those of man they have a king and a queen which at first have wings later they lose their wings and the queen grows until she is thousands of times larger than the workers and is kept in a special chamber in the center of the pile here she is attended by the workers small ants who carry out the eggs which are laid by millions and placed in nurseries or small cemented cells designed for the purpose sometimes the queen lays as many as eight thousand eggs a day an army of workers carries them off builds new nurseries and adds to the heap if an enemy appears the soldiers rush out these have large heads and enormous jaws and are well fitted by nature for the work they have to perform the cunning and intelligence of white ants are well displayed in their attacks upon houses having decided to enter a house they begin to tunnel some distance away and finally reach the corner post or some timber that enters the ground with remarkable speed the workers enter this hollowing it out until it is nothing but a shell they eat to the very surface leaving only a faint ghost of a partition and what appears to be a solid block is really so thin that a finger can be thrust through it so clever are these little ant miners that they have been known to come up through the floor directly beneath the leg of a chair and burrow and eat up through it so completely devastating it that when the owner moved it the small hole in the floor appeared and the chair fell in pieces in the isle of france a new building was ruined by these insects in a few months and at colombo a large house suddenly fell in over the heads of the occupants the beams being crushed like eggshells the work they accomplished in this way would hardly be credited were it not for the substantiated statements collected by the authorities in the countries where they are mostly found the so-called caddis worms are merely the larvae of the caddis fly which encloses itself in a case that is often decorated in a singular way the cases of a number of the worms placed together display a striking variety of designs some roll up leaves others spin a silken thread from the mouth and bind pieces of leaves together attaching other pieces to it end of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of Half Hours with the Lower Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter 22. Some Mimics. All insects have a continual struggle for life. They constitute the food of many birds, and very few of the young escape these watchful creatures and attain mature life. To enable the insects to escape, nature has given many a strange protective garb which is called mimicry or a protective resemblance sometimes it is color an insect mimicking a leaf in color or again the insect imitates a twig or leaf in shape and so escapes attention we find examples of this in many families but particularly among the insects now under consideration the mantis belongs to a group in which the insects resemble twigs in shape and color 
and nothing could be more striking than these strange slow-moving creatures they have an uncanny weird appearance and look as though they might have been originally of wood i have seen them in the tropics passing slowly along a limb lifting one leg at a time moving it with all the halting deliberation of an automaton but when the mantis perceived me it stopped just as it was the foot that was in the air remaining as though it had been frozen in the act some are a vivid green and in them the resemblance to twigs is very striking i once encouraged a number to live in my preserves where i watched and studied and often fed them they would take a fly from my hand by a very rapid movement of the cruel forehands or claws which were toothed when food was scarce the insects would devour one another in the most deliberate fashion then assume the quaint supplicating position with claws up from which the insect is called the praying mantis my specimens deposited their eggs in a curious case about an inch long resembling a trilobite which they attached to the fence and colored the exact hue of the latter the fence was not painted and varied in color yet the nests always agreed more or less exactly with the shade or tint of the plank or base to which it was attached in south america is found a huge mantis so powerful that it captures birds by grasping them in its terrible claws the insect is described by burmeister as crouching on the limb imitating it so closely that the bird approaches it without fear in java a beautiful pink mantis is so perfect in its mimicry of a pink orchid that insects alight upon it and are caught a philippine island mantis is remarkable for its resemblance to a dried and withered leaf the chief characteristic of this insect is its cool deliberate ferocity devouring its mate with indifference lunching calmly upon its young while they are dining among themselves when fighting they have the characteristics of the bulldog with many times its endurance a mantis will continue a combat even when part of its body is cut away i have seen one deprived of all its legs cling to a limb with one claw and continue to reach for its foe with the other closely allied to the mantis and even more remarkable as mimics are the walking sticks phasma i have kept them alive and often have been unable to see them when i knew they were directly beneath my eyes so remarkable is the mimicry they have no biting claws merely long antennae a long stick-like body and straight jointed stick-like legs some are green the most remarkable are those which seem to imitate dead wood i have seen a walking stick that was a perfect imitation of a moss or lichen covered twig the body and legs of the insect being covered with peculiar growths the largest walking stick i have seen was twelve inches in length and one of the most perfect imitations of a green twig that could be imagined this was from the malay country where they grow to a length of fourteen inches they stretch out upon long tendrils extending the limbs or holding them up the poseurs of the insect world the walking leaves philium are clever mimics resembling leaves even the veins and midrib of the leaf are imitated and the insect when crouching on a limb is a virtual leaf so far as appearance goes the disguise being absolutely perfect some resemble green leaves 
others dried and withered specimens. Even the legs of these insects are supplied with a singular growth. Most of these strange mimics are found clinging to trees, but one common in Brazil spends most of the time during the day under water in streams where it clings to the pebbles. In Nicaragua there are several species that resemble leaves in all stages of decay. The movements of some of these insects resemble those of leaves. I saw one in the Sierra Madre range come down from a tall sycamore and supposed it a leaf as it dropped slowly zigzagging down. I should not have discovered the mistake had not my dog recognized it. End of chapter 22chapter 23 of half hours with the lower animals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jeffrey smith new orleans louisiana half hours with the lower animals by charles holder Chapter 23 The Grasshoppers and Locusts These forms may be considered the musicians of the insect world. None of the insects can produce vocal sounds, that is, they have no voice, but they have certain appliances which enable them to produce sounds which can be heard a long distance. On hot days in summer is heard the constant and shrill zzing of the locust, while countless varieties lend their aid in producing a volume of sound. The instruments in the locust are minute teeth, arranged along the thighs. These are rubbed against the forewings, producing the remarkable sounds. The locusts are commonly called grasshoppers. They have two pairs of net-veined wings and hind legs adapted for leaping, by which they send themselves sprawling through the air, almost invariably using this method of escape instead of unfolding their delicate wings. All are mimics. The common ground locust resembles the dusty road and dried foliage which it affects. Others which live on plants are a vivid green. Some which I find in my garden resemble closely the tender shoots of the passion vine upon which they feed. The locusts, acridity, have short antennae large glassy eyes, and ears at the base of the abdomen. The female is provided with an appliance called the ovipositor, four sharp points with which the grasshopper digs holes in the ground. Later, these are used as a guide or funnel for introducing the eggs into the burrow. The mouth is supplied with parts adapted to biting. When a grasshopper is caught, it exudes a peculiar fluid resembling molasses, a secretion of the salivary glands. The eggs are deposited in masses from 60 to 100. The young resemble the parent, but at first have no wings. The grasshopper, in making its metamorphosis, or change from one stage to another, casts its skin in a manner calling to mind the crabs. In a word, it molts several times. In accomplishing this, it often climbs a spear of grass and there shuffles out of its old skin and jumps away, leaving the hollow skin clinging to the grass. At times they appear in vast numbers and in clouds rise into the air so that from a distance they might be taken for smoke or a tornado. This cloud is made up of starving locusts which devastate the countries they infest. 
they alight upon a wheat field and an hour later hundreds of acres appear as though a fire had swept over the ground every spear of grass every leaf has been devoured by this insatiate throng which cannot be destroyed or even checked in africa swarms have been swept by the wind out over the ocean to be washed in in such vast numbers that they formed a line fifty miles long and three or four feet high along shore creating an odor which drove people from that region jaeger the naturalist rode through a swarm in russia for four hundred miles where they were two feet deep the entire country was devastated by this band of locusts and tens of thousands of human beings were threatened with starvation the government troops were ordered to the place and warfare declared against the locusts the soldiers being armed with shovels instead of guns a line of thirty thousand men moved slowly forward covering the insects with earth or digging them under while in various localities huge fires were built to burn the ground and destroy the eggs despite this thirty thousand people starved to death the direct result of their raids almost every portion of the earth away from the poles has been threatened by these raiders there are many references in the bible to these insects and their ravages have been carried on from the earliest times known to man in america the rocky mountain locust is the most destructive and many of the western states have been ravaged by them onward they came a dark continuous cloud of congregated myriads numberless the rushing of whose wings was as the sound of a broad river headlong in its course plunged from a mountain summit or the roar of a wild ocean as the autumn storm shattering its billows on a shore of rocks southey some years ago a flock settled in colorado springs the streets and roofs being covered with them so that they were swept and shoveled about like snow some american swarms have been traced for several hundred miles and settling on railroads have stopped the trains by making the tracks slippery alighting in a cornfield the rustling sound of their depredation can be heard for some distance and when they rise a fire might have swept over the fields so far as appearances go the swarm a black portentous cloud sweeps on flying at a rate of thirty miles an hour to reach some new field where they dig burrows with their curious ovipositors and deposit their eggs by millions then they move on leaving an unborn swarm to develop and later constitute another army to spread devastation abroad in the land the crickets are familiar forms with cylindrical bodies and large heads placed vertically the ovipositor often being as large as the entire body the female often deposits three hundred eggs in the ground the note of the cricket is produced by the male and is a decidedly musical chirp varying in the different kinds the close observer may easily find the cave house of the little singer that is often seen sitting at the entrance singing not at the top of its voice but with the full force of its wings the sound being produced by using the fore wings as bows and the hind wings as fiddles and sawing with great rapidity the crickets are found in the greatest variety some live in the ground others affect houses and in the tropics beautiful tree crickets are found the snowy tree cricket has a peculiar note te reet te reet 
the broad-winged tree cricket has a call which resembles a dog whistle another has a piping note resembling the thrilling musical sound made by rubbing the edge of a glass with one's finger the singular cave cricket is wingless and has antennae several times the length of its body the western cricket does great damage to the crops of the farmer and when bands are seen marching over the country ditches are often dug into which the crickets plunge where in default of food they begin to devour one another the cry of this cricket is harsh and disagreeable the musical instrument being on the dorsum or back of the shield which seems to cover the forepart of its back the curious mole cricket which burrows underground and is provided with enormous jaws is a menace to the gardener in the outer florida keys i found that it was almost impossible to rear plants so plentiful and ravenous were these fierce root eaters end of chapter 23chapter 24 of half hours with the lower animals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jeffrey smith new orleans louisiana half hours with the lower animals by charles holder Chapter 24 The Beetles The beetles are insects having their forewings thickened to constitute sheaths or covers for the lower pair used in flight. Their mouths are adapted for biting and they pass through a complete metamorphosis. There are about 90,000 species ranging from minute creatures to huge lumbering goliaths when walking the beetle presents a trim appearance enveloped in a gleaming armor of the highest polish and often ablaze with metallic tints but when it flies the elytra or wing covers are thrown up and a pair of soft silken wings flutter out stiffen and bear the beetle away the head of the beetle is small and adapted for biting the digestive apparatus is simple the most noticeable feature of many are the antennae which often are very long and ornamental the eyes are compound the legs are strong and powerful the beetles spend little time in flying many being flesh-eaters and continually searching for game under refuse and in dark places. They lay eggs, which are deposited in the ground or in special cavities made in wood, which hatch into larvae. In the tiger beetle, the larvae resemble white worms. In the rose beetle, they look like grubs these in time change to helpless pupae the june bug the beetle which dashes into rooms blindly charging lights of all kinds is a familiar example its larva is white and very destructive on my lawn in california the bermuda grass often turns white and sections a foot square can be lifted having been cut off from the roots by this destructive larva of the june bug which during this stage of its existence lives underground eating roots and plants of various kinds for two years this beetle lives a subterranean marauding life growing and shedding its skin it is often considered a complete animal but at the end of this period it changes into what is called the pupa stage which does not move 
the pupae are white soft helpless creatures which are found around the roots of rose bushes in great number and which are so appreciated by mockingbirds that they and the blackbirds invariably follow me about the garden when i am overturning the soil with the trowel finally the pupa changes into the perfect insect the larvae of some of the spring beetles remain in the grub stage five years and are known as wire worms, doing a vast amount of damage. The girdler beetle bores holes in tender limbs of the hickory, then systematically girdles the limb below the eggs, so that by the time the young hatch they have soft dead wood to feed upon. The bark borer penetrates the bark of trees and cuts winding tunnels here and there, in which are placed its eggs. Among the most attractive of the beetles are the carnivorous sexton beetles. They find dead bodies with all the skill of a vulture, burrow beneath them, and deposit their eggs within the body where the young feed. The work these beetles accomplish in destroying animals and even burying them renders them valuable scavengers. Among the destructive beetles are the buffalo bugs, which have been introduced from Europe. The larva of these is a strange, fuzzy little creature. The weevils are the bane of the dweller in the tropics. They infest bread, cake, and flour, and meal of every kind. Perhaps the most dreaded by the northern farmer is the potato bug, which plays havoc with potatoes, often ruining the entire crop, the vines being covered by the soft and disagreeable larva, more like a worm than anything else. The diving beetle is an interesting insect, being a flyer and a swimmer. Its hind legs are fringed and adapted for swimming. On the forelimb is a sucker, or several, by which the beetle can attach itself to any object. The larva is a ferocious creature, armed with a pair of fierce jaws, with which it attacks small fishes, frogs, tadpoles, and game very much larger than itself. End of chapter 24。Chapter 25 of Half Hours with the Lower Animals。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter 25. The Bugs. The bugs are easily recognized. They have the mouth parts arranged as a sucking beak or proboscis. The chinch bug, the squash bug, the 17-year cicada or locust, and the bean aphis are well-known examples. They represent a group dreaded for many reasons. Many are parasites on man and beast, while many others destroy crops of various kinds. In nearly all freshwater ponds and pools, curious, flat, long-legged creatures are seen darting over the surface, being perfectly at home. They are the water boatmen, and one species is found far out at sea. In passing in review the various insects, the peculiar transformations through which they pass are noticed, some long, some short, some partial, and many complete. In the cicada, or 17-year locust, or harvest fly, we have an instance of one of the strangest examples of slow development known. The cicada is a wedge-shaped insect, having some resemblance to a huge fly. 
at the base of the abdomen is a drum-like organ by which it makes a shrill zing sound which when thousands are joined in concert produces a remarkable sound audible for a long distance i have heard it half a mile with the wind and by following it up found a grove filled with insects producing a roar of sounds while clinging to the trees and branches were thousands of empty skins from which the cicadas had escaped the cicada deposits three or four hundred eggs in holes on the twigs or bark of the oak they hatch very promptly in six weeks or so and we might conclude that the young cicadas would soon appear but seventeen long years of life underground are now required before the pupa crawls upward molts and appears as an adult cicada it has spent all these years as an almost helpless creature resembling the mole cricket subsisting by sucking the juices from the roots of plants waiting for the ending of its imprisonment on many plants the stroller through the garden will observe bits of white froth like soap suds and few persons were they not in the secret would believe that the froth is an especially devised medium for the little leaf hopper the adult insect is a curious little creature found among the grasses in spring the young require moisture to enable them to attain their full development and when hatched they climb up stalks of grass and pierce them with their beak-like proboscis and gorge themselves with the juices the insect now exudes a foamy secretion which bubbles up about it in time entirely surrounding itself in a mass of moisture the insect converts this into air globules by pushing its tail above the mass and seizing air in its claspers which it passes beneath it to the spiracle or breathing pore in this way it breathes and also fills the section about it with air there the animal passes the time until it is ready to change when it escapes and becomes a perfect leaf hopper the famous cochineal insects belong to this group they are minute creatures which live upon certain cacti in the tropics when collected they form the celebrated dye another form produces a valuable wax who has not found his rose bushes swarming with minute green bodies the aphidae brush them off at night and in a few hours as many more are seen due to the marvelous rapidity of their increase the eggs are laid in the autumn and hatch in the early spring the young then appearing as wingless little creatures which in turn produce not eggs but winged or wingless aphidae these appear in such numbers and so quickly that in a single summer a pair of plant lice will produce one quintillion of young ones can we wonder that it is difficult to keep the rose bushes free from such a swarm the story of the development of these insects is but merely touched upon but it is among the most remarkable of all the strange and unexplainable transformations we find in animal life here we may glance at the countless scaly insects which infest fruit of various kinds the black red and cottony scale are common in california and have to be fought with all the cunning and intelligence that man can invoke in eighteen eighty six the orange groves of southern california were almost ruined by the cottony scale i have seen trees that looked as though the limbs were covered with snow but an enemy of the scale a little spotted ladybug was imported from australia and in a few months the scale had disappeared 
the black and red scale and several others are pests which devastate the groves stopping the growth of the trees and operating against the fruit grower who is obliged to spray the trees with poisonous washes to destroy them end of chapter twenty five Chapter 26 of Half Hours with the Lower Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter 26 Flies and Mosquitoes The flies and mosquitoes are among the greatest pests and dangers to man. Both are conveyors of disease, and the former, as an agent of destruction, deposits its eggs in meat of all kinds, making it impossible to keep meat in some countries. On the other hand, it should be remembered that the flies are valuable scavengers, hastening the destruction of dead matter which might contaminate the air. The flies are two-winged insects with mouth parts adapted for lapping or sucking. Under the microscope, these organs often appear to be composed of needle-like bristles, forming a proboscis protected by a scabbard or sheath. In some flies, this weapon is many times as long as the body. The head is well separated from the body and movable. The eyes are compound and simple, made up of many facets. The wings are gauze-like, often beautiful, and when the fly is in motion, they move in a figure eight, making, it is estimated, 19,800 revolutions a minute. The feet enable it to cling to the smoothest surfaces with ease. The little pads are extremely irritating at times when the fly walks over the flesh, tapping here and there with its soft tongue, in which all parts except the labium are rudimentary. The latter has a broad tip for licking or lapping. The flies breathe by spiracles and are among the most active of all insects and the bravest, attacking man and beast and refusing to be driven off despite the most active and spirited defense. The development of the house fly is a familiar process. The eggs of the flesh fly, as an example, are small white objects which hatch into maggots. These change gradually, finally becoming pupae, then assuming the adult form. The blue bottle fly is one of the best known. The house fly is found in greatest numbers near stables, as there, in the piles of refuse, the eggs are deposited, hatching in 24 hours. The young appear as fleshy, soft, footless worms or maggots, which are ravenous and live upon the most fetid matter for two weeks when they change into a pupa, a barrel-shaped cocoon-like form. For two weeks this remains motionless, when out of it breaks the perfect housefly, soon to deposit its eggs and help produce the tens of millions of flies which swarm wherever human beings are found. Among the many species of flies, some are bloodsuckers, as the horseflies. The robber flies are the hawks of the race, carrying off other insects, even large dragonflies. The many species of horse flies attack horses and cattle, and the animals are often driven to a frenzy by their approach. An entire herd will recognize the approach of these insects and stampede. 
many of the flies deposit their eggs upon the hairs or nostrils of horses flies exist in countless varieties from harmless creatures to some in africa which are deadly to cattle and horses from the ordinary fly whose larva lives in cheese to others which thrive in alcohol and wine in california the larva of one species is found in lake mono where no other animal can live hundreds of bushels of them are sometimes washed upon the beaches constituting a favorite food for the indians the warfare declared against mosquitoes in america suggested by dr howard has attracted widespread attention to these insects which have rendered many localities absolutely uninhabitable a florida physician informed me that in a certain locality horses had been killed by these insatiate bloodsuckers which are now known to be the carriers of the germs of yellow fever over almost every pond or pool in summer they may be seen in countless numbers filling the air with their disagreeable music the proboscis or sucking weapon of the mosquito is an innocent appearing object when closed but when the sheath is open it displays a series of scimitar and sawtooth daggers which fully explains the torture of the mosquito bite or that of the gnat which crawls up one's sleeve in all these extraordinary weapons we find the same organs the labium labrum and others but with greater or less development according to the nature of the insect it is the female mosquito which occasions all the trouble and renders mankind miserable in some of the otherwise most delightful resorts on the florida keys i always had a mosquito bar overhead not merely over the bed but suspended from the ceiling in midday even then these pests would force their way through the meshes the development of the mosquito is interesting the eggs are deposited as a boat-shaped mass on the surface of the water where they drift about for several days the larvae appear as wigglers floating in the water tail upward and breathing through a tube at the tip of the abdomen which is projected above the water for the purpose after a while the head grows larger and several changes ensue then the pupa finally appears this rises to the surface and out bursts a full-fledged mosquito which like a man in a canoe balances itself while its wings dry a few hours before it was entirely dependent upon the water and swimming in it but now it appears to be fearful of overturning the frail craft and falling in where it would surely drown if all goes well it soon tries its wings and goes buzzing away the devastation caused by the armed and bewhiskered mosquito is not generally known doubtless thousands have lost their lives from this unsuspected cause the common gnat has habits similar to those of the mosquito they are often seen floating in the air in great swarms or bands rising and forming as though in some mystic dance closely allied to these forms are the fleas which are at once interesting and irritating they are wingless and have two simple eyes the larva resembles a small caterpillar it attains its growth in 12 days then enters a small cocoon which it weaves there it remains for 16 days when it breaks forth a full-grown flea of all insects the fleas are the most amenable to instruction some years ago a flea circus was one of the attractions of new york where by looking through a magnifying glass one could see fleas dragging chariots with other fleas dressed as cavaliers sitting on the seats 
many other seemingly impossible feats were exhibited. End of chapter 26. Chapter 27 of Half Hours with the Lower Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter 27 The Butterflies and Moths. Of all the insects, the butterflies are the most beautiful. Nature has arrayed them in coats of many colors. Every tint and every possible shade of color, including metallic, is found among them. In some of the South American forests, they are of gigantic size, a blaze of iridescent blue, as though formed of the most delicate flakes of that beautiful mineral labradorite. The butterflies add to the beauty of nature. Among the trees they congregate, forming dashes of color, red, blue, green, and golden yellow. They vie with the flowers in their splendors. Besides being ornamental, they accomplish a great work in carrying pollen from flower to flower and from plant to plant. They have small heads, short antennae, and four beautiful wings, which are covered with minute scales. Each of the latter, when examined under a microscope, becomes a resplendent object, glistening like the plate of some gorgeous armor. The mouth parts are adapted for sucking, and are coiled up when not in use. They consist of two tubular or hollow threads. The ordinary caterpillar is a larva of the butterfly. The eggs are deposited on leaves in various places, and soon hatch into caterpillars. These lead a predatory life for some time, doing a vast amount of damage, almost every plant having its peculiar pest. Some affect one tree, some another. The famous elm trees of many of the New England cities have more than once been threatened by these larvae. They shed their coats several times. The caterpillar finally merges into the chrysalis, from which it escapes as the perfect insect. All of these changes can easily be observed by keeping a caterpillar under continuous observation. The butterflies have well-developed legs, but they rarely use them for locomotion, preferring to fly from flower to flower. The tortoiseshell butterfly is of familiar form, its marvelous colors resembling this shell. Some have an undercovering of pure silver. Another conspicuous form is the white butterfly, which, as its name suggests, is pure white with several black dots. When the butterfly is at rest, its wings are held aloft and many are so colored that in this position the wing resembles a leaf and the animal escapes observation. A marvelous example of this protective mimicry is observed in the East Indian butterfly, Kalima. The wings have a little projection which resembles a stem from which a dark mark resembling a midrib extends. When the butterfly alights, this seeming stem, as shown in the illustration, appears to join to the branch, and the resemblance to a leaf is so perfect that the most careful observer is often deceived. Other butterflies observed by Wallace mimic dry oak leaves and dead leaves of various kinds. All the spots and colors of decay were imitated in their wings. Other Indian forms resemble fungus and utterly disappear as they alight upon it. No more attractive butterfly is seen than the finely marked Vanessa, the peacock butterfly, which has beautiful peacock marks upon its wings in vivid blue. In Southern California, almost every spring, there is a migration of butterflies from the south northward to the Sierra Madre. I have watched them for hours, numbers being seen over a given spot every moment. By writing to postmasters and other persons in different sections, I found that the migrating band was 200 miles long and from 10 to 20 miles wide. Doubtless this was but a fraction of its actual extent, it being made up, in reality, of millions of yellow butterflies. Darwin saw such a migration in South America. Their pathway was several miles in width, they filled the air like a yellow cloud, and were several hours passing a given point. Vessels out at sea have met with similar flocks blown away from the shore. The butterflies are included in the Lepidoptera and are the day-flying forms. There are many other insects equally beautiful in more subdued tints, which are night flyers. These are the moths, which are slow of flight, ponderous, and have extraordinary tongues for sucking the juices from the flowers. They can be distinguished from the butterflies by their feathered antennae. One of the best known for its ravages is the dwarf moth the worm of which plays such havoc among woolens. The cankerworm moth is equally a pest among valuable shade trees. Another familiar form is the hawk moth, which so resembles a hummingbird in appearance and motion that it is almost impossible to distinguish between the two, the moth being one of the most active, poising over flowers and inserting its enormous tongue to secure the sweets there concealed. A showy moth is the huge atticus, 
its larva being especially large and voracious. The moths display as great a variety in their shapes, colors, and sizes as the butterflies. The dead's head moth is perhaps as startling as any, bearing on its back a well-defined figure of a skull. The most valuable moth to man is the silkworm moth, the wings of which have a spread of six inches and are a brilliant ochre yellow, fawn, or mouse color, marked with a striking peacock-like eyes. They deposit eggs, but the development of the caterpillar is somewhat different than that of the butterfly larva. The latter passes its pupa stage as an unprotected chrysalis attached to some object by the tail, but the caterpillar of the moth secretes silk from a gland in its head, and with this forms about itself a cocoon. Then, this is unwound by machinery and woven into the valuable silk of commerce. The silk industry brings to the weavers of the United States alone an annual sum amounting to about $30 million. The silkworm can easily be kept and all its changes watched, and many persons are interested in rearing the worms. The time required by the worm to form its silk cocoon varies with the locality. Thus, in France, it will complete it in four days, while in England, 40 or more days are necessary. About 200 cocoons weigh a pound. Silkworm moths are ravenous eaters, living principally on mulberry leaves. They show much intelligence in forming their cocoons. Thus, a South American moth forms a basket-like structure which it suspends from some limb. The cradle swings in the wind like a seed pod, more than anything else, and would never be suspected of enclosing a living creature. Many of the moths, by some remarkable instinct, deposit their eggs where the young will find an immediate supply of food. This care for their young is the cause of a vast amount of damage among fruit trees. The fruit moth, as an example, deposits its eggs in fruit. The caterpillar penetrates it and devours the interior, thousands of bushels of apples being destroyed yearly in this way, not to speak of other fruits. One of the best known of the moths is the tent moth, the larva of which forms a tent-like web for its protection in the trees it affects. A richly tinted flyer is known as the goat moth, the caterpillar being a large and beautiful creature. End of chapter 27「Chapter twenty eight of Half Hours with the Lower Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter twenty eight The Ants. If the question should be propounded which next to man is the most intelligent of animals, the reply might be the ants. For after a careful study of all the ways and habits of these small insects, it will be very evident that the lives of many are conducted with more method than the lowest human lives. The ants belong to a great group called Hymenoptera, insects with membrane-like wings including the gallflies, bees, and wasps. Ants are found everywhere. Long lines are seen marching along, some coming, some going, in countless multitudes. Yet drop a strange ant into this highway and it is at once discovered and in danger. If water is poured into a nest of ants, the inhabitants come rushing out. Some come to fight, and others bear in their mouths the young, countless thousands to a place of safety. The ant is a trim, vigorous individual, fleet of foot, tireless, never weary, brave, industrious, a type of the worker. The head is large, the eyes are compound with three single eyes. The antennae are long, slender organs by which ants appear to recognize friends or foes and possibly talk with them in some way. Certainly when two ants meet, a very strange interchange of courtesies with the antennae is performed. The males and females are winged, and there is a third kind without wings, called workers. Ants live in vast communities of from 100,000 to 500,000 or more. They excavate the soil and gravel, descend into the ground, and tunnel it in every direction. In certain places they store food, in others eggs. The affairs of the vast underground city are carried on with a marvelous method. Although the ants have wings, these are soon cast away. At certain times the winged males and females swarm out of the nest and fly away, forming other communities. The males soon die, the females rid themselves of their wings, and thereafter remain in their new nests. The entire work of the community falls upon the so-called workers. They make the nest, repair it, do the fighting when necessary, move the immature young or eggs, shut up the nest at night, and open it in the morning. The eggs are minute, and as soon as laid are taken by the workers, or nurses as they are also called, and carried to favorable places, 
where they are carefully watched. They are shifted about and occasionally, for some reason, brought above ground. The larvae, when they hatch, appear as little worms or grubs, which would starve if they were not constantly fed by the nurses. If it is too cold, these babies are taken up into the sunshine or placed in some hall near the surface where the sun's rays can reach them. Finally, they change to the pupa stage and are covered by a web. They are still cared for with the greatest solicitude by the nurses, which stand by when they finally hatch out and aid them in their entrance into the world. Nurses in every sense of the word, their care at this time is one of the most remarkable exhibitions of human traits in a lower animal known. Many other human traits find their prototype among these minute animals. They care for the young, the sick, and the wounded. They go to war, capture their foes, make slaves of them, and force them to work. They keep certain insects for the pleasant odor they afford, and others for the secretions they emit, the latter action resembling keeping and milking of cows. Ants build remarkable houses arranged in rooms for various purposes. They plant gardens to raise certain crops. They introduce plants that will provide certain food. They retard the growth of seeds in the granaries, build vast underground or covered roads to escape the heat, they make bridges to cross streams, and in numerous other ways they demonstrate their remarkable intelligence. The extent of the homes of ants is astonishing when we bear in mind the size of the insect. Some often extend many feet underground, and their tunnels have been traced beneath the broad Paraiba River of South America. Many different species of ants are known, all interesting for their singular ways of living. The foraging or slave-making ants of Africa go to war against other ants. Such foraging trips are carried on with remarkable discipline, and the warriors may be seen returning, a triumphant army, bearing the eggs and larvae of the enemy, which they nurse and bring up as slaves. These slave-makers are large and powerful ecotins, the dominant race of the ants. Among the slave-making ants, the owners often become so dependent upon the slaves that they are almost helpless, and would starve were it not for these dependents. The so-called honey ants of Texas exhibit some remarkable traits in the manner of their lives. These ants, which I have observed in the Garden of the Gods, Colorado, select certain individuals as storehouses and supply them with honey until the abdomen is expanded to many times its size, resembling a bottle. The ants, when filled, are placed in a compartment made for the purpose, and there hung to the wall animated honey jars, which are taken down and made to give up their sweets as occasion demands. These honey balls are considered a delicacy in Mexico and are served as dessert. Among the ants, those of Texas known as the agricultural ants are remarkable for their intelligence. They are farmers, laying out places where they cultivate a certain plant, which is especially to their taste, just as farmers plant corn. End of chapter 28。Chapter 29 of Half Hours with the Lower Animals。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Half Hours with the Lower Animals by Charles Holder. Chapter 29 The Bees and the Wasps. In almost every flower bed in the garden, we shall find the bees, examples of tireless energy, storing up honey for their young in such vast quantities that the surplus forms a valuable food supply for man as well. The nests of bees are systematically robbed of their stores, and for this purpose the insects are supplied with artificial nests or hives, in which they deposit their honey entirely for the benefit of mankind. Here we see a singular limitation placed upon intelligence. The intelligence of bees is wonderful and amazing. Many of their acts and works suggest those of human beings, yet when the time comes for thinking after the fashion of men, the bees are lacking. They go on storing honey in artificial hives without being able to bridge the mental chasm and perceive that they are being robbed and made to work as virtual slaves. Hence we assume that the intelligence of bees is not on the same plane as that of human beings. They appear to be acting upon a strong instinct which impels them to perform acts which seem intelligent. The head of the bee bears two remarkable compound eyes with three simple ones between them. The antennae are short. The mouth parts are complicated and adapted for sucking up the honey or sweets of flowers or the juices of fruits. In California, the bees eat fruit as well as honey and even flesh of meat in very dry seasons when flowers are scarce. The abdomen of the bee is supplied with a saw-like stinger or dart, which inflicts a painful and poisonous wound. In general appearance, the ordinary honey bee resembles an ant with wings, but the bee is hairy, it has a sting, and the legs of the worker are provided with honey baskets, which carry pollen. 
Bees are of several kinds, queens, workers, and drones, there being a division of labor. The queen is the largest, the drone is the smallest, and it has no sting. The history of the bee and its development is one of the most wonderful chapters in the whole story of animal life. Glancing at the interior of a hive, we see that the bees have constructed a series of hexagonal cells. To learn how they have accomplished this, we may follow a bee in its flight. This may be one or two miles from the hive, yet so perfect is the knowledge of the bee of direction that it is rarely lost. Reaching a flower, it sucks out the honey, which it swallows. It then takes pollen, the dust from the stamen of the flowers, and stows it away in little baskets attached to the legs. It also takes a wax-like substance called propolis from buds of various trees, which it packs with the pollen in the baskets. Arriving at the nest, the bee with countless others engages in the construction of the cells, which are of various sizes. The material for building up the cells is wax, which is secreted by the bees, appearing in little flakes under the abdomen from which it is taken by the legs of the bee. This is a material from which the comb is made, while the propolis is employed as a cement to attach the cells together and for various minor purposes. Think of thousands of workers bringing in this material, working in the dark, yet never making a mistake. The bee finally ejects the honey which it has swallowed, placing it in certain cells where it is sealed up and remains until it is needed as food. The pollen is also placed in cells. A single community of bees may consist of 200,000 individuals. In the hive there is a single queen, which often lays from 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day, and if we could follow her, we should find that she lays the eggs in different cells, and in cells of different sizes. In the first are eggs which develop into workers, and in the second are larger eggs, which will produce males, called drones. The little eggs soon hatch into white grubs, which are carefully fed by the workers with digested honey and pollen. Finally, the young larvae almost fill the cells and then stop eating. The workers cover them in, and each spins for itself a silken cocoon, in which it remains until it breaks out in the form of a perfect bee. The workers build certain large cells on the side of the comb, which are called queen cells and the larvae which appear in them are fed with some peculiar food which produces queens. The workers watch each of these cells with great care, gnawing the wax away on top so that they can observe the progress of development. Finally, a small hold is made through which the proboscis of the young queen protrudes, and in this way it is fed for several days, during which it utters a low, piping noise. The queens attack each other on sight, and previous to the appearance of a young queen, the old one, with thousands of followers, makes her escape or swarms. Then the workers liberate a young queen, and if there are others, they are repeated swarms, each queen leaving with a multitude of followers, till the hive has but one queen. There are in the community now a number of drones, and as they appear to be an expensive and worthless burden to carry during the winter, the workers attack and kill them, throwing them out of the hive. Among the many kinds of bees, the carpenters are famous, boring tunnels into solid wood for the reception of their young, half an inch a day being accomplished by these little carpenters. The bumblebee, one of the largest, forms its nest in the ground. The wasps live in society of males, females, and workers. The paper-like nests are familiar objects in the woods, resembling great bags of paper which, when opened, are seen to be filled with cells. Many nests are beautiful shapes, resembling candelabra, while the cells of the common mud dauber call to mind the adobe houses of the Mexicans and Indians in the southwest. The mud cells of a South American wasp resemble bottles. Many of the large wasps are fierce and vindictive, and nearly all resent an attack upon their homes. End of chapter 29